Hi there, my name's Kirsten. This is the Paper Dense Podcast, episode number 16, I believe. Episode number 16. I'm a knitter in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I'm a stay-at-home mom to my two rambunctious children. Um, I'm also a bereaved mother, and part of how I have been coping with life is by knitting, and part of how that has looked is me starting this podcast. And um, yeah, it's been over a year, and it's been, I guess it's been 16 episodes, and it has been such a positive thing in my life this last year, and I so appreciate that, that all of you have made that, yes, have like given me that gift. Um, and so I am, I think I say this all the time, but I'm just like, I'm so appreciative of all of you. So thanks for being here. Um, I am on Instagram as at paper.knits and I'm on Ravelry as this is paper knits. Feel free to come find me there if you want. Um, I have not been t posting a ton. I always say that. I always feel like I should be posting more than I do, you know, the like algorithm gods and all of that. Uh, but I post when I can, and um, when inspiration hits about something, yeah, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, I've got a handful of things to share today, pretty pretty standard, like my FOs, a um, couple whips I've been working on, and yeah, I'm excited about about what's been, what I've been working on. We've had really hot weather here in July in Edmonton. It was, like, just, it was too hot um, to, like, you know, 36 feels like 40 kind of thing, which is not uh normal for here although I fear it is becoming more normal because our world is dying um and yeah I don't like it I don't like the heat uh, we don't have air conditioning um and it like really sucked the life out of me and just the last couple days it has like cooled down a little bit we got some rain it's cooling down at night so we can like cool down the house we had a couple nights where we had to like sleep downstairs I was like ugh, like flayed out like in my underwear trying to go to sleep and so then once it like finally cooled down again and I could like put on my matching jammy set and like put on my sheet <laughs> over top of me and like curl up in bed, it was so nice. But it meant that I, yes, I was feeling gross, I think, just like trying to knit. And I was just like grumpy and like I didn't have good motivation about things. I cast on a super random project that I will show you later. Um, but now I've like gotten back into the groove a bit. So I finished this sweater. Um, I am almost done my Lume pullover which I meant to podcast like two sleeves ago but instead I just like finished the sleeves and I'm almost on the body but I ran out of yarn spoiler I just told you everything already about that sweater I wasn't sure I'm not sure I'm gonna last wearing a knitted item right now um it is cooler but it's not that cool um I finished this and I couldn't wear it because it was so hot. It's the middle of summer. Obviously, this is a wool sweater, DK weight wool sweater. Um, but then it was like so, so hot. I couldn't even like pretend to be able to wear it. Um, and it's still a little bit too hot for it. But I will wear it as much as I can today before I start getting overheated. Um, getting all like set up for my podcast. By the time I'm like sitting down, I'm like sweaty and out of breath. And <laughs> I have to like chill for a little bit. I like set up the fan in front of me and like wrote some notes so I could cool down a little bit so anyways that is what is coming I have been trying to put um I don't know what YouTube calls them chapters maybe in the description box so if you want to like skip ahead of my rambling and like just get to my finished objects or get to that next one or jump to the end or like whatever I try and like put those timestamps in and I also put a ton of stuff in the description box because I love information I love links I love being able to like, hey, what did they say? And then like go and immediately find it in the description box. And so I have everything linked there. And so it's either like linked to my Ravelry, it's linked to like the website where I bought the yarn, uh, linked to somebody's Instagram if I mention it, whatever, like it's all there. So if you also care about those things, then check it out. And yeah, let me tell you about my sweater because I'm really excited about it. Um, so this is the Admix Pullover by Jared Flood. It just came out pretty recently, like in March, I believe. And as soon as I saw it, I just was like so enamored by it. Um, I, and I wanted to just like recreate the sample that they had. Um, it was like red and blue. It was like the very specific yarn. I knew I was gonna use the Brooklyn Tweed yarn for it. And it just like immediately, the project formed in my head. I was like, yep, I'm making that sweater. And I have 
accumulated some Brooklyn Tweed. Um, I don't, I have a, like a sweater quantity of Peary, um, which is maybe good now because they're, they're not making it anymore. But I like, it feels like kind of precious. So I don't know what to make with it yet. And I made my son a sweater out of shelter that he, or loft, I think out of loft that he wore like two times. And then he's kind of iffy about wearing hand knits. And so now it's too small for him. Um, and I don't think that I have knit with it otherwise. And so I knew that I wanted to like knit with the Brooklyn Tweed for this. And yes, part of that I will tell you more later. But so it is knit with Brooklyn Tweed Arbor, which is their 100% Targi wool DK weight. And then also with Dapple, which is their cotton merino blend. And so that's what the blue is. The red is the um, Arbor. It turns out in the sample, it's more of like an orange red color and then this blue. But when I like looked it up, I was like, oh, just kidding. I don't want to exactly recreate that, like the sample photo. I want red instead. And so that's what I did. And I'm, I'm really happy with it. Like it looks to me like what the sample photos look like, unless you like really zoom in and then like see what the skein color actually is, that it's like definitely more red or definitely more orange. But I really like this red. It's like the perfect, I don't know where my, uh, I was going to show you like a close up of the color, but I don't know where it all went. I guess I could show you my little swatch. Um, that's covered in hay from me winding some kind of rustic yarn. So it is just to me the most perfect red. It's kind of, I want to say it's like kind of like a blue red. It's really hard for me to capture it on like when I'm taking pictures of it. So I'm trying to get the lighting right, trying to get the white balance right. I'm like trying to edit it afterwards to like get a like clear picture of like what the like stitch pattern looks like, what this red looks like. I'm just so happy with it. And so even if it does not come across exactly how I want it to with my like limited photography skills, um, I, I love it. And it was like such a pleasure to knit. And I only have good things to say about this, I think. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just super happy with it. I'm going to stand up a little bit and show it off. Um, it's hard. It feels awkward to do this, like, perching in front of the camera here. But, so, it's, like, not quite cropped. There was a couple different length options. I decided on, like, the three-quarter length sleeve. It is knit bottom up in pieces. And so you knit the back, or the front, and then the back. And then they get seamed at the shoulder. And then you pick up and work the sleeve flat and then seam all down the sides. And so cool construction. It was really nicely laid out in a pattern. I think when I first talked about this, I kind of shared some more about like how much I appreciated the pattern. It's a, it was an expensive pattern, more than I, like more than standard, like more than average of what a pattern costs on Ravelry. But I feel like it was worth the money. Probably people should be charging more for their patterns with the amount of work that goes into them. But how it was laid out was really helpful for me. They had a lot of different options. They had a lot of information. They had really nice diagrams. They had a really clear um, schematic. And I like having all that information and not having to guess or do the calculations myself. I ended up having to do some calculations because my gauge was different, but it ended up meaning that I cast on for a size three and I got the measurements for a size four. Everything like, worked out really good. I just like had to be careful along the way. The description for the pattern calls this stitch a tuck stitch variation on moss stitch. And I don't remember reading that before, but now that I've read that, I'm like, oh yeah, totally. Like that's exactly what it is. And it was like very rhythmic and I really liked it. It went so much faster than I was expecting. I had knit the front panel and then kind of set it aside because on the bottom you do a tubular cast on. And I couldn't remember exactly how to do it. I had to look up the video. I was a little bit worried I hadn't written down what needle size I had used. Um, but then when I was on vacation last month, I cast on the back when I was like nice and quiet and I had time. And I like zoomed through the back panel. Um, I was really surprised. The pattern gauge is 20 stitches by 44 rows. Mine ended up being well, my swatch was 18. I mentioned in my first 
when I first started talking about this, when I first cast it on, that I swatched so many times with like multiple needle sizes. I bought bamboo needles to try with that, to see if that made a difference. I could not get a gauge tighter than 18 stitches. And so I was like, fine, like just, that's what you want to be. And so it, I really like it. Like I like the fabric. I think it worked out just fine. Um, and then, yeah, my row gauge ended up being a little bit different as well. And so I just had to make sure I was paying attention to like, you know, when it was telling me to knit X many inches, when it was telling me to next, you know, knit X many rows before doing like some shaping or something. Like I just kind of had to pay attention to that. I did run into a little bit more math that I had to do when I was casting on for the arm. Um, in the pattern, they have a broken rib for this band around the top of the arm. And I had swatched for that, which I think is what that one was that I just showed you. I can't remember now. Um, yeah. And I didn't really like the look of it. It was a much different gauge than um, the Admix pattern. I re-swatched once, I, when I like blocked the front and back, waiting for them to dry, swatched again for the, you know, this band here. Didn't really like it. Um, swatched again. No, I think I just like cast on and I did uh, just the admix pattern, but just with one color. And so instead of knitting two rows blue, two rows red, I just did them all red. Um, but I didn't really like the look of that either. Like it, part of why the pattern looks so cool is because of the colors and like how the little like blips of color show up. And so what I ended up doing was just what I think is half fisherman's rib around the top of the sleeve and just did it in the same needle size as the rest of it. It is a little bit tighter than um, like the rest of the sleeve, but it looked like from people's like sample knits, like they also looked like that. And so I think it's fine. I didn't want it to be like tight and then kind of like ballooning out, but it's just like a little bit tighter. Um, and so, yeah, I did change that. And I like, I like that. Like, I like the look of it better than the broken rib and I could just continue on with my um, same needle size and whatever. Um, I did have to pick up a different number of stitches than what it called for and I picked up the wrong number of stitches, had to rip it out, redo it. And so that was a little bit more like figuring out. I also, when I blocked the front and the back, I took out all my stitch markers and I shouldn't have done that because it had a stitch marker that shows you where the sleeve pickup was supposed to start. And so I had to like, it took me a while to like figure out again where those sleeves were supposed to be. Some of the sizes have shaping right at the underarm, right at the start of the underarm, but mine didn't. And so I, I had to figure it out. One thing that's nice is that it's really easy to count your row gauge because each color is two rows. And in theory, it was really easy to seam and like match up the side seam here because you knew exactly this blue row and this blue row need to go together. I am shocked that my seaming matched up. Um, like in terms of when I knit it, I like knit the right number of rows each time. Um, but part of that is because I counted a lot because it was really easy to count. And that was nice. Um, I did find, initially I'd started doing mattress stitch to seam up the sides. And all, it was always off kilter. Like it was always one stitch, like one row off. And it was so noticeable then because of the color changes. So I like, I tried quite a few different times doing that. Looked up a couple different tutorials. So just like make sure I was doing it right. Eventually gave up and just like backstitched it. And I think it's, it gets fine. Um, so it was, well then it was very easy to like match up my rows and make sure that they were very even. And so it looks like, I think really tidy along the sides. I really like that. Um, the collar here then is knit afterwards, picked up and knit uh, double folded. Um, it is a bit high for me. And so like just of like what I usually wear, it's comfortable. I think I haven't worn it. I haven't worn the sweater long enough to know if I'm like feeling like I need to like yank it down. And so we'll see, there is like, um, like how the back is knit. It is knit so that there is a difference between the front and the back, which should bring up the back of the collar, which should lower the front of the collar. But I just haven't had a chance to wear it long enough to like decide if it bothers me or not. Um, 
One other thing that I did not pay attention to until after I was done <laughs> was that the dapple skeins look quite different from each other, or they can. And so I bought, I think every skein that the fiber nook had of the color that I wanted, which was blueprint. And they looked like very, very similar. Like if you look up pictures on the Brooklyn Tweed website of the different colorways, they show you that like how variable they can be. Some of them are much more white from the cotton. Some of them are much more whichever color, like more saturated color from the wool. And mine looked very similar, but you can see it on my knitting then of like where I switched skeins. And so if I had been paying attention to that and remembered like, oh yeah, they recommend alternating skeins. Like I might've faded in the new skein. It doesn't really bother me that much. I don't think when it was like laying out blocking on my floor and I'm like sitting here knitting on my couch and like looking at the like, I can see this like line, but tell me if you can see it, I guess. I, I can't see it in my little tiny screen. Maybe right here. I think it's lower than that though. Anyways, um, it's fine. I, it's not a stark contrast and in a like fluid moving of me like existing in my life, I think it's fine. Um, so yeah, overall this is like, it's what I wanted it to be. I was expecting it to take me longer. It did take me a while. Like I cast it on in April and I just finished it, um, July 19th. And so, but that wasn't me like consistently knitting on it. It was me like powering through the first part of it and then putting it away for like a month. Um, but the actual like knitting of it, I found it really, it was really rhythmic. It was really soothing. It was kind of like potato chip knitting of like, oh, I'll just get to the next one. Oh, I'll just do the next one. Like, oh, I might as well just like do my two red rows. Oh, I'll just do a couple, I'll just do two blue rows. And it was very enjoyable. Like it was, it wasn't one that I could knit while I was um, talking to people or like having to pay attention to something else but I could still like watch a show or like watch YouTube, watch podcasts or whatever with it. But if I was like trying to like have a conversation with somebody, no, I think I could, I think I did. Um, once I got the hang of it, it was fine. I had said too that I, when I swatched, I like made sure that I had um, double checked what it would look like if my stitches got off by one so that I could catch it. And it was very clear because instead of it being moss stitch, then it looks like ribbing. And I didn't even mess that up one time. I don't think I had to tink back even once. Except for like, oh, I knit a couple extra. I was supposed to knit to like eight before the end of row or something. And I like knit till six through the end of the row. And so I had to just go back a couple. Like that was it. And you will hear later that that was not the case for my other sweater that has a similar pattern to this. And so I was quite happy with that. Um, I have not been sharing the price of my FOs lately purely because I have forgotten. Um, and yeah, I've had like mixed opinions, I think about uh, if people like knowing what things cost or not. I appreciate knowing what things cost, I guess. I like that. It's just like more data. I like that. I think we all know that Brooklyn Tweed is like on the pricier end in terms of yarn. Um, this wasn't actually as expensive as I thought it was going to be. I also had, I think I have an entire skein of the red leftover and a part of a blue leftover. And so, because my gauge was different, then my yarn quantities were different, blah, blah, blah. Um, part of why I wanted to like bring it up again about this one is because I bought this with a gift certificate from the Fiber Nook my favorite local yarn store um, that a friend had given me um, back in February because I had a miscarriage and yeah I she's not a close friend she's acquaintance she's a like a work friend of my husband's and um, I was very touched that she um, like she supported my husband really well at work um, but I was really touched that she like went out of her way to like look up someplace in Edmonton. She like knows that I knit, knows that I love to do that and wanted to, yeah, do something very like intentional for me. 
And so she found the fiber nook. She like had printed out directions and stuff about like where it was. And I was like, I am familiar with it. Thank you. <laughs> but I just really appreciated that. And so she had given me a gift certificate and I knew that I wanted to use that for something special that I knew I was going to remember what it was for. Um, and so, yeah, I then was very like glad that the fiber nook had exactly what I wanted in terms of like these colors and this exact base and all of that. Um, and yeah, so yeah, if you've been here before and you know about my, like I said at the beginning, like I'm a bereaved mother, my daughter passed away um, at one week old in December, 2022. And um, yeah, trying to decide about, are we going to try again? It was like a really big life decision for us. And it took us quite a while to get pregnant and then I got pregnant and then I had a miscarriage and you know what it sucks um yeah and I I filmed an episode I think the day that I found out that I was pregnant and I was so I just was so happy and very quickly um things went downhill and yeah, it just was an interesting experience to go through after having our like full term loss and then having this like daring to hope again for another child and then just to be like, psych, nope, here, have more grief instead. Um, so yeah, I've been feeling conflicted about if I was going to say something about it or not on here. It feels weird, I think, like sh talking about. Okay, here's the here's the thing. This will be fun for me to edit later. Um, I started this podcast because because Beth died. I had been wanting to start it for a long time. I was too scared. And then sometimes when you go through a major life event, then you have to be like, I should just do the thing, do the things that I want to do. And for me, that was putting myself out there putting myself on the internet and like making podcasts. Love knitting. Knitting has been so helpful in general in my life has been so important for me in my grief. It was so, it was such an important part of my pregnancy. It was a very important part of my like postpartum grief period. It has been this like sustaining thing for me. And I feel worried that people are gonna be like, blah, okay, Kirsten, we get it. Like your baby died. Um, because I keep bringing it up because it's like, yeah, it affects me every day. Like it is something that I, is with me every single day. And there is, um, yeah, one thing that's been important to me is like talking about these things because it's important that we know how to talk about them. They're awkward to talk about sometimes. It can be uncomfortable to talk about. Um, sometimes people don't know how to reply. Um... The amount of, you know, the percentage of people in the world who've like had a, had their infant die is different than the number of people who have had a miscarriage. And so then I was feeling like there's so, like miscarriage is so common. And like neonatal loss is like shockingly common also, but miscarriages are so common. And so I was like, why would I talk about one of those things and not talk about the other thing? when I'm positive that so many of you can relate. Um, that if you have not experienced a miscarriage yourself, that you have somebody close to you who has. And yeah, I just think it's important to be able to talk about. Um, it has been something that I kind of like, like, I don't know how to cope with this and I'm gonna put it away in the back of my mind. And Yeah, not, like I feel like I had good tools already having gone through what we went through with Beth. Um, I had my grief community. I had, you know, my grief books. I had my, you know, all the things that I've learned about myself. Um, I've had, you know, we are, my husband and I already had a real good, like, scaffolding there about how to, like, handle another loss and 
but it wasn't it was something that I was like I don't I don't want to have to deal with this I don't want to have this is this should not be something that I have to deal with um like thank you very much world I've had enough fucking around with my um family so yeah again for those of you who get it you will get it knitting this sweater was part of what that grief looked like for me and um yeah, even after all this time, I still feel self-conscious about saying that because of people who don't get it. Like, what, what does that matter? I started all this by talking about how much the sweater cost. <laughs> ah. Okay, the so sweater cost $142, all of the yarn that I used for it. And I am very appreciative that I was able to buy it with this gift certificate from an acquaintance. And... <laughs> Is there a small child coming down the stairs? Oh, what do you want to do? Okay. My turn now? Okay. Um, I have to remember now what I was saying. Remember I said I was going to feel awkward if you were sitting here? Is that okay? okay. Sometimes when we feel awkward, then we can still be brave and do the same. I, yes, I feel very um, appreciative that I was able to buy this special yarn for a very special project from somebody who was um, sort of willing to see my grief, I guess, in that way. And so now I'm sharing that with you guys. Um, it maybe feels weird to, at least I feel self-conscious about it too, that I'm like, I'm so excited about my sweater. Oh yeah, here's why I knit it. Um, but that's just all part of the complicated process of grief. And um, yeah, I hope that you guys also can appreciate that. So yes, here's my Admix pullover. Um, I really like it. I'm excited for the weather to cool down so that I can actually wear it. I think it's going to be a good, like, comfortable throw on with pair of jeans, like sweatshirty kind of vibe. And I am really looking forward to that. Okay, my other FO, I have a very, very, my Luma sweater is like so close to being finished. But well, this was done. I couldn't wear it because it was too hot. Um, I was feeling very like just untethered about like where I wanted to go with my knitting. Um, started like sifting through random yarn bins, found this random skein of yarn, and then found a project to make with it. And it was a tree. So let me get it. Maybe you saw it already. This is my Wee Apple Tree by Imagined Landscapes. And it is very cute. I don't know why I made it, except that I found this yarn. I had this, I think it's 50 grams of River City Yarns Epic. Uh, that was called Into the Woods. And I think I got it in a, like in a grab bag maybe, like at a knitting festival like years ago because River City Yarns does not make yarn anymore. Um, and I don't know why this is what I pulled out of my bin and I was like, I'm going to knit something with this. And so I was like looking up frogs and looking up um, cactuses and looking up um, mostly those, mostly patterns for those. But then I came across this little tree and I was like, oh, that'd be perfect. Like I have the green and the brown. Um, and it's just very sweet. And I knew, imagine, I've never knit an like a gnome from Imagine Landscape, Imagined Landscapes, but I was confident that the pattern would be great. And it was. Um, quick, quick little knit. I knit it, um, not really paying attention to how much yarn I had. Um, well, I started paying attention because I was worried I was gonna run out of the green. And so I made a few modifications along the way and made it a little bit more like squat but I would have had enough and so that's not necessary but um anyways so this one I did not keep track of how much yarn I used or what the cost would have been because um it was just a random little skein that I had I have not made the apples yet I need to dig through my jar of minis there and make some little apples I'm going to take some sweet little pictures of it in my apple tree I grabbed a skein of Retrosario Mondim for the trunk 
and then my son asked, why is it gray? And I said, no, no, it's brown, I promise, but it kind of looks gray. But isn't it cute? So it is filled with uh, dried chickpeas and some stuffing so that it can stand on its own. And it's just, it's just random and cute. And this is my other FO for the month. Okay, here is my, it's so close to being an FO, it seems ridiculous, but my Luma Pullover by, sorry, Nordland. I'm so happy with this one. I cannot wait to block it. It's just gonna, it's just gonna be so nice. And so last time I showed this, I had most of the body knit. I had put the sleeves on hold and maybe, I don't think I'd even started knitting any of the sleeve. I wasn't sure if I was gonna do the color work at the bottom of the sleeve. And yes, like I said, I was going to podcast two sleeves ago, <laughs> but this week I knit both sleeves. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much about this because literally it will be done in the next episode and then I will tell you all about it, but I have run out of yarn. And so I, yes, I am, this is how much I have left. Um, and I have to do another inch of ribbing on the bottom. I, I think I will probably end up just making it shorter, but I wanted to see how far I could get. Um, I also realized like, oh, I could like rip out my swatch, but it's like, the, it's just, it's the cutest little swatch on my board. I don't want to get rid of it. And it won't be enough to get the amount of ribbing that I need. Um, I could just do this little like one centimeter worth of ribbing, but I can't even bind off. Um, I promptly went on Ravelry to see if anybody had the same dye lot. Um, I found somebody who did. We'll see if they get back to me. Also, my friend Megan from Woolen Cottonwoods made a sweater with the same yarn. And so I was like, wait a second. I remember this very random fact from months ago. And so I messaged her today to see like, hey, do you have any leftover? Also, what's the dye lot? I don't want to buy a whole skein, another skein of yarn. If I could just find somebody who has some in their stash, like I would appreciate that. So anyways, we'll see what happens with this. But... I am really loving it and I will talk more about it next time whenever, I guess it depends if I can find more yarn. I will probably just end up shortening it a little bit. But anyways, lost at yarn chicken. I have an entire skein left of the white, but I am out of the black. So yes, I'm looking forward to being able to wear this one this winter. Okay, my actual next whip is in my very cute train case from Della Q that I showed last time. And it's just so adorable and I love it. I wound up on my minis last week and then they like perfectly fit in this top section. And it was so cute. And then I had to make a reel and then I made a YouTube short out of it too. And so it's just, it makes me very happy. So it just like comes out like this. I have made a small amount more progress on this since the last time. Um, But not a lot. This is where we're at. Here's the right side. I had not yet added the first color um, the last podcast. So now I have three stripes. And I had been worried if I would be able to understand what I was doing when I picked it back up again because it had been so long. But it ended up being fine. I understood my directions that I had rewritten. Um, however, then I immediately made a mistake and then had to figure out how to rip out Half Fisherman's Rip. And so that wasn't super fun. Um, okay, back up. I am knitting this. Did I say what this was? This is the Straya by Andrew Mary. It is a top-down raglan Half Fisherman's Rib cardigan with um, little contrast color stripes all the way through. And I'm knitting this in Sonder Yarn Sunday Morning 4-ply. Um, the main color is whale watching and it's kind of this like bluish gray. I really like it. This is the four ply base. Um, this is the first time I've knit with this one. I'm really liking it. Oh yeah, I mentioned last time that I also knit something with the Luxe Sport base. And I have obviously not washed this yet. I did wash my swatch. The Luxe, Luxe Sport base has cashmere in it. I swear that this is softer, which doesn't make sense because cashmere should be softer than just the wool. Um, but I swear that this is softer. 
So I will report back about that. Um, anyways, so I had rewritten the instructions for the Raglan so that I could understand what was going on. And then I was so excited to like get to my color. I wound up all my little mini, I have five contrast colors. I do not like winding yarn, but got them all wound up, added in my first stripe, knit, I don't know, four, six rows after that. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. This doesn't look like how it's supposed to look. And yeah, I just like, I did it completely wrong. And so in the pattern, it says in the instructions in the beginning that you have to start, you add the new color on a wrong side row. I just assumed that it would be on a right side row. I also assumed that I would be doing four rows of color and not two. And so it looked very different than it was supposed to. It looked, it would have been fine. It just like was not, it did not look how it was supposed to. The, you know, the stripe was twice as thick as it was supposed to be. And so I kind of hemmed and hawed about it for a little while and started looking up tutorials about how to um, add an afterthought lifeline to Half Fisherman's Rib. Ultimately just was like, that is so fiddly. I don't know what I'm doing. I will not know what stitch is which. I won't know where my raglan markers are. I just pulled my needle out and ripped a bunch of yarn out. And then very carefully, I got to like the second last row and then very quick, very carefully took one stitch out at a time and put my needle in. I took out another stitch and put my needle in and somehow managed to salvage it. There's the increases on it are like a knit one, yarn over knit one. I don't know why that was the row that I ended up picking up. And so I managed to save all of that. I had one mistake near the end that I had, I think added an extra stitch, but I was able to fix it. I was certain that I was gonna have to rip out, like not be able to figure out where I was and rip it out and restart, but I fixed it. So what I was saying earlier, but with this, I knit this entire sweater without messing up the pattern. The half fisherman's rib is essentially the same as this. Margo was snoring behind me. Can you hear her? I got an inch into this one and made a like pretty big mistake that I had to figure out how to fix. And so it was a, it was a pain. I hope I will not do it again. I can definitely see myself knitting too many rows before I do the next stripe or not knitting enough, whatever. Um, one thing that's nice is that there's a nice like spreadsheet of your size, which row you're on. If you need to do a raglan increase, if you need to do neck shaping, when you need to switch colors for the whole yoke. Um, and so that is quite nice. I ended up going back and redoing that also because, okay, again, loath to say anything critical of Andrew Mowry. Um, she's literally a super popular designer. I am not. I just think that my brain works in a different way than hers. The style of her writing and her patterns is not it doesn't click super well for me. And so yeah, it had this nice like spreadsheet. Um, and yes, it did tell me earlier in the pattern that I had to add the new color on the wrong side. I think that it would have been helpful to have that information in the pattern where you needed it to be. Anyways, I made my own little spreadsheet and I did it in these colors so that I could just have a visual as well. The colors in the pattern are like highlighter pink and yellow not in her knitted item, but like in the pattern they are. And I, it's like, it's, I don't like it. <laughs> so I made my own little spreadsheet. I have, when I need to change colors, I have um, which color it needs to be, etc. Yes, I'm also finding this very rhythmic. It's like I said, essentially the same pattern as this. And so I thought I would be sick of it after finishing this sweater. And this one is just basically that same thing again, but I'm really liking it. This has the added bonus of like, getting you know some stripes and so it's like okay great oh I'm almost at the next color I'll just like get to the next one um it was a little bit of a bummer to have to like rip out you know two inches worth of work and then redo it but anyways so yes here's my beautiful little minis and I like wasn't exactly certain what order I wanted to do them in um I decided you know what it doesn't really matter I think it will look fine no matter what um I just didn't want to go like, you know, to do this one as number five and then this one as number one so that they would be a high contrast right next to each other. And so I think whatever, it's fine. Um, okay, what else do I want to say about this? I think that's it. We'll see how it comes along, doing it so far. Now that I, again, have exactly the instructions that I need in a way that my brain 
can click and understand what is going on, I think it will be smooth sailing. So, and I love my little train case and it just feels so delightful to me to like open it up, and like pull my knitting out. So the other thing that happened in the last month is that uh, it was Calgary Stampede. I'm in Edmonton, I'm not in Calgary. I did not go to Stampede. Um, I have not been to Stampede perhaps since I was a small child that lived in Calgary. I'm not sure if I've gone as an adult, um, but it's a big deal um, if you are in Calgary. And what I did to participate in Stampede was go to the Stampede breakfast hosted by Ancient Arts Yarn. So Ancient Arts, I will say it forever, my favorite yarn company. Um, they have a wonderful storefront now in Calgary that I've not been to. This is their second Stampede breakfast that they have done. And they had a nice pop-up, they had a bunch of vendors, they had pancake breakfast. So they had, you know, their storefront open, they had vendors out in the parking lot, they had, yeah, nice breakfast going. The Yarn Rebels group here at Edmonton, somebody had asked to the group, hey, does anybody want to come? We could carpool. So just her and I drove down, we were out the door at like quarter to seven in the morning, drove to three hours to Calgary. It was a super hot day, it was way hotter than I thought it was going to be. And I totally missed the memo that like, oh yeah, it's Stampede. People dress Western when it's Stampede. And so there was like cowboy boots, cowboy hats, like Western garb. I don't own any of those things. And so it doesn't matter even if I had, I kind of have cowboy adjacent boots, um, but that's the best I could do. But I did wear my summer sorrel top that I knit out of Ancient Arts yarn. So that felt also appropriate going to one of their events. And it was really nice. We had a really nice day. It was like kind of whirlwind and um, it was very hot. But the inside of the store itself was air conditioned. We, yeah, wandered around to some different, to the different booths. I bought this braid of fiber from Flock Fiber Studio. It's merino cashmere, 80% 20, 80% merino, 20% cashmere. As soon as I touched it, I just like, I was like, ooh, that's lovely. And I like went and looked at something else in the booth. And then I like <laughs> went back and I was like, mm, I'm gonna buy that. I've not spun cashmere before, um, or like a blend. So anyways, it's quite fun colors and yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So, um, and then I bought a couple like trinkety kind of things. I bought a couple stitch markers and some stickers and stuff, um, which maybe I'll add in a picture of what they look like. I don't remember all the details now, except that one of the stitch markers looks like um, a UFO and so it's my down bad stitch marker and if you know you know um, that's a Taylor Swift reference I have an audience now okay. How's it going? it's going not super great now plan to buy a main color for a sea glass cardigan. I had like pulled out a bunch of stuff from my stash, like leftovers from other sweaters and like tried to like figure out what my contrast colors would be. And I like brought them all along with me to compare to colors at, like that I could see in person from Ancient Arts. Some of the contrast colors are Ancient Arts. And so I thought, oh, I'll, you know, I'll get the main color from here too. But instead of buying a sweater's quantity worth of yarn, I bought a sock machine. And so that was not planned. Uh, they had, yeah, alongside all the vendors and stuff, they did a little tour of their dye studio. And then they had somebody who was spinning and weaving. And then like somebody was spinning, somebody was weaving, and then they had a circular sock machine demonstration. Somebody there, you know, showing how it worked. And while we were waiting to get in to the dye studio tour, I like was watching her like beelined over to her and then I like see that she has a sign at the bottom saying like for sale <laughs> like a list of all the stuff that was included and I like went back and talked to her multiple times and eavesdropped as other people asked her about it um yes asked her one bazillion questions and uh then I bought it and so yeah that was totally not ever something that I would have uh thought that I would be coming home with that day I have for sure looked into them before um, I used to have a flatbed knitting machine, which was able to knit in the round. And I had, I have a couple socks that I made on it, um, and a variety of other things that kind of never turned into anything. It was a really steep learning curve on it and it took up a lot of space and it did not bring me joy. And so it got 
rehomed to somebody else who hopefully is enjoying it. Um, but I guess now I'm going to learn how to use the circular sock machine. So it is an antique. It's from 1942. It's in really good condition. I will, yeah, I'll put in some video here and pictures and stuff of what it looks like. Okay, going to try and show off some of this knitting machine here. This is Fitzwilliam. I forgot to mention that when I was filming before. I was trying to feel inspired by like what I should name it, name him. I was looking up names for like what was popular in 1942. Like turns out lots of those names are the same as today. It's like Matthew and like Thomas and whatever. I decided that his name was Fitzwilliam. Named after Fitzwilliam Darcy. He's like a little bit of a curmudgeon, a little bit rough around the edges. That's, that's the inspo there. This is my cast on bonnet that I made. I had a ton of leftover cones of random acrylic yarn and stuff from my last, so uh, my last knitting machine. Um, and so that's been really nice. I just have lots of things that I can practice with and not feel bad about. So yeah, this is the 72 cylinder that I have on here. This is the 48 and the river. I haven't figured out at all how to do that yet. Um, it drips oil. And so I just have this like very beautiful old ratty towel um, here. This was a interesting contraption that I had not seen before, but it's to help with the cast on process. And so I learned how to use that. This is the cone winder. I have a variety of cones that also came with it. So you can, you know, put the cone on and then wind up a cone. It comes off the cones more smoothly, which helps with tension issues and stuff. And so instead of just having like a center pull ball or something, she recommended, um, yeah, putting everything onto the cone. Here is the weights that I add on. It is surprisingly heavy. Um, the little, I cannot remember what it's called. Um, not sure. I don't want to call it a clamp. I think there's a different name for it but you like hook that on to your project and then you put this absurd amount of weight on it and i also have these adorable little weights for doing heels and toes i believe so obviously not at that point yet to figure that out yeah there he is I'm delighted. Like, I'm so excited about it. It is also a learning curve, but there's way more information on YouTube and on the internet in general about using a circular sock machine than that very specific 1980s flatbed knitting machine that I had. So I think that that will be better for me, like, figuring out how to use this. I, like, immediately that night, like, cranked a, like, cranked a sock tube, which maybe I'll describe right now. There was already, you know, something cast onto it. Um, when I brought it home, she just left it on the machine for me. And so I just added in my yarn and cranked a random skein of um, self-striping new sock yarn that I had, which is from Wool Baron, I believe, which is a local dyer to me. And I had previously knit this tube on my other, um, like a flatbed machine that can do the circular thing. It's kind of confusing. I don't understand enough about how it works to explain it uh, any differently, but, and it's, it's like very, very fine gauge and like too small. Um, and so then I did one on the new sock machine and to compare it, and this is too big. <laughs> so I need to do some learning, obviously, um, figure out like the right stitch size, um, tension, all of that weighing it blah 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 all of the things have since cranked another tube i will just show that one too i guess just a second this is sock nato from ancient arts it's called eye of the kraken and i had bought this skein like a couple years ago intending to you know hand knit it into socks it's just a cool like it's a cool colorway and it was so like fun seeing it emerge like cranking the sock tube i am going to use this as my like sample sock to figure out i was yeah fiddling around with stitch size, those kinds of things. Um, I am just in the process of picking up the toe and I will hand it the toe. I'm gonna measure the gauge of this, wash it, check the gauge again. I have a lot of sock NATO yarn kicking around that I would really like to be able to just crank into tubes, um, but this also is too big. And so I'm a little bit worried that the 72 um, 
needle cylinder is just like not going to be a good fit for me. It might mean that I buy another maybe a 64 needle cylinder. Um, I'm going to do some more learning about that. I'm going to test out the 48 one. Um, I have some DK weight. It's like sock yarn. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. I'm excited to keep learning about it. It's only been like two weeks and so um, there's lots of learning ahead. I've like joined a couple Facebook groups. There's so much information out there and like some really cool things that people are making and so I'm excited to to learn about them. So anyways, new fun craft for me to learn and work on. I have talked about my dislike of knitting socks on this podcast in the past and it's true. I don't I don't like knitting socks. I do like wearing my hand knit socks though. And so this might, we'll see. Yeah, we'll do some more figuring out. The next exciting thing that's coming up is Knit City Calgary. And so I am very excited about that. I'm taking three workshop, I'm doing three workshops and going to the Friday evening, like knit night kind of thing with the grocery girls. I am really looking forward to it. I'm anticipating it being kind of overwhelming for me. Um, but I've been like super jazzed about it since they announced that they were coming to Calgary. So my son, my son just wrote me a note and asked if I would please share the alpaca. So I will. Was wondering if I have done anything yet with this alpaca that he picked out at the Rose City Fiber Fest. And I have not <laughs> done anything with it yet. Um, but he was reminding me about it. Lace weight alpaca in this like very bright yellow color. He wants a neck warmer that may or may not have a hood on it. And so we will see. I told him he probably does not need a neck warmer right now in the middle of summer, but that I will make him something. I am currently making, I don't know if I've shown this yet. The other skein that I had bought, this is from Over the Moon Yarn. Um, I also bought a, uh, I think it's just a sock yarn and I'm making a muscle bra hat for my other son. It sits next to the table and I, pick it up and knit on it every once in a while. Um, I keep being like, it's, I'm sure it's long enough by now, but it's like, I have got quite a bit of yarn left. Um, and I just haven't measured it to see actually how big it is. Okay, that is all of the things I wanted to share today. I feel like it's like, I feel like I did a bit of a jump scare about the, this is my miscarriage sweater. Um, and also, that is also just the reality of, life with grief and yeah having to navigate life alongside um crappy stuff that happens and so um anybody else out there who has experienced that sending you a hug and i hope that you can all appreciate where i'm coming from but why i wanted to talk about it I don't know what the future will hold for us um, in terms of that. We can make all the plans that we want and sometimes those things just don't, yeah, we just don't get to, we don't get to control what happens. So as always, I appreciate all of you for joining me and letting me just like info dump about all of my knitting things that I love so much. It really, it brings me a lot of like joy in my soul to be able to do this and um, yeah, I just appreciate all of you for being here. I always love reading people's comments and sometimes I don't reply to them because I see them the moment that they come and then I'm like, I gotta be chill, I can't, I can't reply right at this exact moment and then I forget. <laughs> so sometimes that happens, um, but I do try and reply. It just sometimes is three weeks later and I'm like, oh, I forgot. I thought I did, I replied in my head and then I didn't reply in real life. Um, but I really appreciate hearing from people and yeah, like I said, you can find me on Instagram and I've got all that linked down below as well. Okay. I better wrap it up here. My battery just started flashing at me. So yeah, take care everybody and I will catch you next time. Happy knitting. Bye.